Uh, take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 10. Uh, usually I you know, take a break after each, uh, each kind of chapter to give us well, a break, something a little different, but we're, uh, we're going to keep going in, in Romans here, uh, in chapter 10. Uh, and some of it is, you know, because it's so closely tied to, to chapter 9, I, I don't want to just take a break, but uh, anyway, uh, Romans chapter 10, and let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll, uh, we'll start going through this here. God and Father, uh, thank you uh, once again uh, just for who you are. Uh, thank you for all the opportunities that you have given us. Uh, and Father, uh, just as we've been talking about it, and we're going to get to, uh, or Romans is going to get to a little more in depth, uh, just the opportunity we have today under grace. Uh, so Father, uh, let your word just reassure us, uh, and may we be uplifted by it today. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Romans chapter, let's actually go back to chapter 9, and let me read the last four verses there. So beginning Romans chapter 9, verse 30, it says, What shall we say then, that the Gentiles have followed not after righteousness, they have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith? But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, how could this be? Because they, Israel, sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion uh, a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now, earlier in chapter 9, we read that not all are Israel that are of Israel. And we talked a little bit about that, and we've talked several times about a, a remnant uh, that... Uh, God made promises to, to Israel, and, and uh, there are physical promises, and that was to the physical uh, lineage of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. However, uh, that just being a physical relative of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did not automatically mean you were going to enter into the kingdom, uh, because uh, there were conditions on that that they had to remain linked to the covenant. And so the Bible speaks of, even in the Old Testament, a remnant. Uh, and the Gospels speak of, uh, of, of, of sheep uh, that are, uh, that are uh, the ones that the Father gave him and all of those. Uh, and so there's that development here in Romans chapter 9. Uh, and now as we get to verses 30, 31, 32, 33 that I just read, God has, has made the decision to offer mercy uh, in the form of righteousness to the Gentiles, to the nations uh, that hadn't been seeking after it. And yet God, the merciful God, has still uh, offered that righteousness and is offering it to them. Uh, so, the, uh, uh, and then it says, but, but Israel, the one that was God's people, they have not laid hold on righteousness. And it gives the, the reason why, because they dismissed Christ. That's what it comes down to. I realize there's words there, stumbling stone and all that, but, but we talked last week about how the stumbling stone is a he, and we know it to be Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ was the, uh, the fulfillment of those promises. He is the promise bringer, um, and uh, he is the mediator of a better covenant. Uh, and they, uh, well, they crucified him. And so, uh, keeping that in mind, we come, we, we start to swing into chapter 10, uh, which further develops this, this thought. So let's now read 10, and I'm going to read uh, through verse 4. That should do us for today, but we'll see. Romans 10.1 says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, 
have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So going back to that word brethren, uh, you know, Paul, I think it was even in chapter 1, um, I know he doesn't in chapter 1, but, but he's talking to the, the saints in the Roman church. He wants them to know this. Uh, later on he's going to talk about, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery. Uh, we'll get there. Uh, but he's, he's talking to these saints, and I use that word brethren. I want to I wanna just kind of highlight it for a moment, because... All throughout his letters, you see Paul's genuine care for people. Uh, they were not just names on a list. Uh, they, were, they were real people who Paul had invested in, or had a, a vested interest in. And even though he, he had not yet visited Rome, he had a, a care and a concern for those people. That they knew... God's truth, and that they were growing uh, in Him, and better understanding of Him. And, uh, and we see this care throughout all of His letters. If you turn to, uh, just an, an example, Philippians chapter 2, I'm going to read an example here. On Philippians chapter 2, and in a moment I'm going to read 25 through 30, uh, but we have Paul uh, uh, mentioning Epaphroditus, who was from that area. And I don't know how much, uh, you know, uh, a commentary I'm going to do on these verses in Philippians, but I just want, to, want you to notice the words that Paul uses to, uh, to describe Epaphroditus, and even his plans for them. And you see care, you see investment. You see concern. You hear, you hear appreciation. And so in Philippians chapter 2 verse 25 it says, Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that he had heard, because you had heard that he had been sick. And indeed he was sick nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him. And not on him only, but on me also, lest I ha should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully, cautiously, that when you see him again you may rejoice and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation. Because for the work of Christ he was near unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. So you see here, just in these words, that, that Paul cared for men like Epaphroditus. And if we were to, to follow Paul as he followed Christ, uh, that care that Paul had for, for fellow believers, we should be like him in that aspect. We should recognize that, uh, you know, our brothers and sisters in Christ aren't our enemies, but they are indeed the brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, and just the investment that Paul had in these people and the way they ministered to him. It's a, it's a two-way street. We minister to others, and prayerfully they uh, minister to, to us as well. And we may not have the same needs, uh, but, but the Lord, well, that's what the body does, the body of Christ does. Uh, so go back to uh, Romans chapter 10 now, and let's keep working uh, through here. Um, Paul says, brother, my heart's desire. This, this phrase means the dear pleasures of my heart, the delights of my heart. So he's saying, so far as it depends on my desire, I desire with all my heart, with the very delights 
of my heart that Israel will be saved. You know, before he, he mentions prayer, and we'll get there in a moment, he mentions his heart's desire. And that's really where our service needs to start. It needs to be with, a, the Bible calls it a renewed mind, but, but we could even say a, a prepared heart. Having concern for our brothers and sisters in Christ, but, but not just our brothers and sisters in Christ, but, but the lost world out there that without Jesus Christ are going to spend an eternity in torment without Him. And so having that desire that people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, but also they continue to, to grow uh, in, in Him. His heart's desire is that Israel's will be saved. And then, uh, he says, in my prayer to God. So not only does he just, he just want it to happen so badly, he has, not only does he have a delight to see it happen, but he prays to that end. He entreats to God on their behalf. He supplicates for them. He, he petitions for them on their behalf. So even if they didn't know what they needed, Paul knew what they needed, and he, and he entreated God for them. And once again, uh, you know, do we take the time uh, to, to not just have a desire for an unsaved, but do we pray for their souls? Do we petition God on their behalf? Look, and I'm not saying this, don't get me wrong, uh, we're not ever going to... Uh, uh, petition someone into heaven. This isn't lighting a candle for someone after they're dead so that God will see and all oh, he has friends or whatever. But but this is God. You know so and so and they're unsaved. Please, if there's any way, use me and, and soften their hearts and all of those things because you know who gives the increase? God does. And uh, look, we don't we don't know we don't I don't have a backstage pass all the, the goings on uh, but we need to be in prayer for people. Uh, and obviously leaving it in, in the Lord's hands. Uh, praying on their behalf. And notice it doesn't say, for Israelites, it says, for Israel. And uh, that ties into the, the rest of this context going forward, really. Um, you know, I think of 1126, it says, and so all Israel shall be saved. And once again, I'll say it's not all Israelites, it's all uh, Israel. Uh, and so uh, there's still this desire uh, for, for God's nation to, uh, to, to, Paul has this heart's desire uh, for them. Um, so, the, you know, another thing I, I'm going to share with you is each, really each, um, well, especially chapter 9, uh, we see, we saw those the first few verses there where Paul uh, is expressing his desire that I wish I were excommunicated uh, on behalf of my brethren. And here in chapter 10, he begins by saying, my heart's desire is that they be saved. And then uh, even in chapter 11, it's not quite the same, uh, but it's that, that final blunt statement, has God cast away his people? No, absolutely not. And so throughout these, we have Paul uh, announcing his concern and his desire for God's nation. You know, it is a uh, unscriptural teaching to condemn Israel and, and Israelites for their, their actions. Uh, you know, you look through history and a misunderstanding of God's plan for Israel uh, has led to many atrocities in, in history. And yeah, you know, we, we praise Martin Luther. Uh, you know, oh, he, the nine, what it was, theses on the wall and all those things. He was, he was awful and what he taught about the Jew. Even though Israel is set aside 
for this age of grace, for as long as it lasts, God is still going to keep his promises to his people. We have not replaced them. Not because God is, is a, or not because Israel is such a great nation and someday they're all going to just, just see the error of their ways, but because he's God that keeps his promises. And so we need to kind of do that balance, or we need to look at Israel today in the correct light. God has not severed them off forever. At the same time, they're not, they don't have a, a special place today above any other nation. Uh, and so keeping that uh, kind of, uh, well, uh, keeping it scriptural, I'm uh, looking at that nation. But here Paul says, my brother, brethren, my heart's desire is that uh, they, uh, they might be saved. Look at verse 2. Let's keep going. There's a connection here, the word for. Uh, it connects it back to the last verse. Um, Uh, and here he says, he says, I bear them record. He can bear witness to the fact. He can testify personally uh, to this, is what he's saying here. I bear them record. I'll go on the stand. Uh, look, Paul used to be an insider. He used to be one of these zealous Jews himself, so he could testify to this fact. Uh, listen to just a few verses. Galatians 1, 14, the last part of it says this. And me, Paul, I profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being exceedingly more, or being exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Philippians 3, 6, he says this, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Acts 22, 3, he says, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, uh, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of my fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. <coughs> and so we have these verses in Galatians 1, 14, Philippians 3, 6, Acts 22, 3, that speaks that Paul had a zeal. <coughs> A zeal for God. And Paul can personally testify. Look, I've seen it. I was there. I can testify that they have a zeal of God. They, you know, they, they, were, they were known as, as the people of God. They, they, they wore that, uh, they wore that uh, designation proudly. Uh, the word zeal, uh, it means to be, to be fervently jealous uh, and ardently inspiring. In other words, there is something we just, we are driven to do or we are driven because of. And these, these people had a zeal for God. And so in this verse, I want to point out that Paul doesn't condemn their zeal. Zeal it is important. We should be zealously... Uh, proclaiming uh, and living out the things of, of God. But he, uh, he does uh, indicate that, unfortunately, their zeal was misplaced. Uh, you know, there are many uh, examples in the scripture of, of misplaced zeal. Uh, one of them is John 16, 2, which, where Jesus warns his disciples, they shall put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time comes that whoever kills you will think he does the Lord's service. So uh, you can't say that those, those uh, Pharisees and scribes, you can't blame them for not being zealous. They were zealous. And they thought that they were doing the Lord's service. So yeah, you can't blame them. They, were, they had zeal. But their zeal wasn't right. It wasn't approved of God. Um, and here, here's the lesson here, is that too often uh, people mistake earnestness with valid faith. We live in a world that, that if we really want something, if we really believe something, then, you know, that makes everything okay. It's like it creates this reality 
uh, around us, and it becomes true for us. But the thing is, is that while Christians should be excited about the things of the Lord, we need to be equally determining that our zeal is pointed in the right direction. That it's according to God's plan and not ours. And so zeal does not equal validity or truthfulness. Uh, it's actually the opposite. We should know the truth and let that motivate us forward. Be excited and zealous uh, about uh, those things. Uh, so, uh, he can bear them record. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Uh, they didn't uh, link that to uh, to truth. They were doing things their way. We read about that already uh, in verse uh, in verse uh, back in, in chapter nine. Um, and we're going to read about it a little bit more in verse three when it says, "For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God." Uh, this is what some have called a culpable ignorance. Uh, and what that means is one has the opportunity to know the truth and instead chooses not to know it. Uh, they couldn't say that they didn't have opportunity. Jesus Christ was among them. Uh, he was doing the miracle and the sign that uh, uh, verified who he was. He was preaching the message to prepare them regarding the, the kingdom. And so, um, uh, we have, we have, they had all the opportunity, but they were ignorant of it. They did not come in, and uh, uh, Jesus even says in, in the gospel that, um, that, that they, they would not come to him. So the, the God would not, God would not give them the truth because they were not open uh, to it. Uh, and so being ignorant here in chapter 3, it explains their state of being. They were in a state of ignorance. Uh, ignorant of God's righteousness doesn't mean that they were, they were unaware of God's holiness, but they denied that the way to it was through Jesus Christ. So uh, they were ignorant of God's righteousness. They, they knew that God was a righteous God. But here, the righteousness of God was among them in Jesus Christ. And so, uh, not acknowledging uh, and not understanding God's righteousness, they went about to establish their own way. Here's the way, and eh, no, let's do our own way of righteousness. So in contrast to, to, to acknowledging God's righteousness and knowing it, they, they decided to seek and strive and endeavor to obtain their own righteousness. To establish means to set up. They endeavored to, to set up their own righteousness. Um, I, I guess I, I shouldn't assume that we should all understand that when it comes to God, right, God's righteousness, He reveals and determines the way to that righteousness. He determined it in the, in the Old Testament. God, uh, Jesus, the, in the Gospels, was saying, "It's me. Um, the kingdom is coming." Believe on me. And even today under grace, we are told that it's by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, in his death, burial, and resurrection, that gives us the very righteousness of God. And so, uh, and yet we still have a world where people and, and, and even denominations and churches are are really ignoring that and coming up with their own way. They're setting up their own way of righteousness. And look, this isn't just, just, I'm going to sound mean here, but 
This isn't just a scriptural confusion. Being able to, to not being able to discern fully. This is setting up your own way. This is saying, yeah, Jesus Christ, but now we're coming up with this whole religion around Jesus Christ. A religion that you are, there are things that you'd be hard-pressed to find any mention of it in, in the scriptures. And not only that, but, but some things in the scriptures, they make them say what the scriptures never intended for them uh, to say. And I'm dealing with this, and I'm, 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 I'm spending time on this because we, there are many people that are zealous of God. And you know, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that there's that desire. But, um, but we are, our desires to go farther than that, and that they, uh, that they can come to God in His way. That they know the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And we should be zealous uh, and endeavor that, oh yeah, they, they, love, they like God and all those things. But no, we want you to know the truth about Him. And come to God in, in His way. Um, because when you set up your own way to come to righteousness, uh, even in the Gospel, Jesus said there's one way. He talks about the wide path, the narrow path, all of those things. Uh, and so there are not many ways. There's one way, and that's God's way. And so here you have these Israelites that, that they were ignorant of God's righteousness. They went about to, to set up their own way. Um, and uh, <laughs> the unfortunate thing is, is that uh, in doing that, notice it says at the end of the verse, they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. They were, they were so desperate to build up what God had been casting down. And that is human righteousness. I turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 9 for a moment. Deuteronomy chapter 9. Deuteronomy chapter 9. I'm going to read three verses here. Deuteronomy 9, verse 4. It says this, Speak not, speak not you in thine, own, in thine heart. After that God, after that the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land, but for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord doth drive them out before thee. Not for thy righteousness, or for the uprightness of thine heart, dost thou go to possess their land. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. And that he may perform the word which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand, therefore, that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. These are some pretty, uh, well, to me, they're pretty blunt words. What is it? At least three times in these three verses, the Lord says, I'm not doing this because you're such good, honorable people. Actually, the last verse here, he says, because you're a stiff-necked people. You're stubborn. You're rebellious. So I'm not doing this because you're so great. I'm not doing this because you are so righteous. So even back here under the law, to take the law and, and cause it one to be puffed up by it, to say, look how great I am. The law should have had the opposite effect. And throughout uh, the, the law and throughout the prophets and even in the, the, the poeticals what we see is, is a humility what we see taught is a humility we, we come to the gospels we see Jesus calling out self-righteousness and yet through all these thousands of years he just didn't get it 
They always set up a system that, that lifted up some. That praised their idea of righteousness. And so there came a moment in time where God said, you know what? I've had a plan, kept hidden from the beginning of the world, and I'm starting it now through you. I'm setting aside uh, Israel and so that I can have mercy upon all. We're going to read about that in, in chapter 11 as we go on here. But first of all, once again, humbling this nation. Paul's saying, yeah, back in Romans chapter 10. Yes, I, I, you know, my, my, my heart's desire and my prayer is that they might be saved. But I can bear record that, yeah, they're zealous, but not according to, to God's righteousness. They're going about to establish their own set of rules and their own way of righteousness. Not unlike the Tower of Babel. Where they tried to reach the heavens in their own effort, through their own effort. And then, we're not going to take time to, to read it, but what a powerful statement in Philippians chapter 3. I already read some of the verses, uh, but, but just all that Paul was zealous for all the, the accolades, everything that he had earned, uh, you know, in his established way of righteousness, he could check every box, and then he goes on and says, but those things that were gained unto me, I counted them all loss for the excellency of Jesus Christ, the knowledge of Jesus Christ. You see, in order to 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 attain to God's righteousness, it has to be a dependency on God to do it His way. And a willingness by the individual to do it that way. And today, there's one way. And it's not through Jesus Christ and your church. It's not through Jesus Christ and that you continue to do good deeds. It's not through doing good deeds so you can finally come to Jesus Christ. It's not through communion and water baptism and uh, sacraments and ordinances and uh, being a good person or whatever else it is. The one way God has said today. The way, we've already read this in Ephesians chapter 3, that, that God set Jesus Christ forth to shed his blood to satisfy his wrath toward your sins. And God accepted that sacrifice. And now because Christ was faithful, God is saying, I have my righteousness available to you if you will trust that my son died for your sins he was buried, and he rose again. Nothing you do, not of works, you can't boast. You, my son, Jesus Christ, did it all. And when we trust in what he has done, we are given the very righteousness of God. And that, that I guess, brings us, well... Uh, first of all, let me let me deal a little bit with more with verse three, where he says, "And they have not submitted unto." First of all, it says there they are uh, they are establishing, they are setting up their own righteousness, and by doing so, they haven't submitted. And what this submission is is it's 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 arranging under something. It's to to become a, a subordinate or a subject. And so God hath said, and they weren't willing to arrange themselves under that. Instead, they went about here to set up their own way. That's what it's saying. Um, because in order to arrange under this, you have to realize you are not the superior. But you need to be arranged under another. And, and again, it comes back to, to humility. We need to put away ourselves uh, in order to, to arrange ourselves under God's way in Israel. They, yeah, they were zealous. They talked a lot about God, but not according to knowledge. They were ignorant of God's way because they would not arrange themselves under his way and instead sought out to set up their own way, which again, doesn't work. Um... 
essentially what this all boiled down to, verse, uh, verse 3, is they missed Jesus Christ. And in verse 4 it says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Another way this could have been said is for Christ is the end of the law with the result or with the purpose that there is righteousness for everyone who believes. Or it could have been said Christ is the end or the termination with the purpose, with the goal of the law is Christ for righteousness to all those believing. That word end is a termination. It's a, it's a limitation. Uh, turn back to, to Romans 3.21 very quickly. Uh, because Paul has already mentioned this. He's now just explaining it a little fuller. Fuller. Uh, Romans 3.21 says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So Paul has already announced that the righteousness of God is man is, is, without the law is manifest. And so he's restating it again that Christ is the termination of uh, righteousness under, uh, is the end of the law. To, to, to gain righteousness. Now Christ is, first of all, Christ is the fulfillment of the law. Uh, once again, I have a lot of verses here. Oh, do I remember now? Let's do it. Um, Christ is the fulfillment of the law. Let me just, I'm going to tell you this scripture. You can write them down, read them later. But Galatians 3, 24 through 25, it says this. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith come, comes, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. For you are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Galatians 3, 24 through 25. Uh, earlier in the context of, of uh, er, I'm sorry, earlier in the book of Galatians, uh, we have this verse, Galatians 2, 16. And that verse is in the context of, of Paul withstanding Peter face to face. And he says this, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ. Uh, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Galatians 2, 16. So now I ask, I mean, did Peter know that it's only Jesus Christ that justified? That no one is going to get to, into the, the kingdom... Uh, through without going through Jesus Christ. Well, let me read 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19 to you. You probably know these verses. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, from your vain conduct or conversation received from the traditions of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Did Jesus know that he was the Redeemer? Well, listen to John 5, 38 through 40. It says, And you do not have his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent, him you believe not. He's saying, God hath sent me, and you won't believe me. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are that which testifies of me, and you won't come to me that you will have eternal life. Once again, I'm going to remind you, it's not that Paul wasn't good at following the Mosaic Law. He says, concerning that, I was blameless. His problem was that he, was, he, had, uh, he had rejected Jesus Christ. Uh, Hebrews 7, 18 through 19 says this, For there is verily a disannulling of the commandments going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by which we draw nigh unto God. And yet, although that was true, although Jesus Christ was the culmination of all of that, verse 33 says they stumbled at that stumbling stone. Verse 32. Because they refused to believe. Yet by God's grace, they could still be saved today through Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is going to go on and he's going to develop. That God has not cast away you completely. You're only partially blinded. You can still have salvation today if you come to God, come to God in his way of grace. And he's going to get into that. Uh, but, uh, but that's a little bit later uh, in, in chapter 10. 
Um, Paul, does, Paul doesn't just say that he's the, the fulfillment of the law. He also says he's the termination of the law. Listen to these verses. Uh, Ephesians 2.15 says this. Ephesians 2.15. Having abolished in the flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself, that's Christ, of two, one new man, so making peace. Colossians 2.14 says he was blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Colossians 2.14 The righteousness is now available through other means. God's righteousness today is through Jesus Christ and Him alone. I understand, you know, you get into the kingdom stuff, you start talking about it, part Peter and all them, what they have to abide by. It gets a little tricky because there's this transition period, uh, uh, going from old to new and all those things. But Paul is clear. There's, there's no law. Dismiss it. We're not under law at all. There's no ordinances. It's Jesus Christ in the law. Uh, notice that, uh, well, God's way up to righteousness today, I think I already said, is through Jesus Christ. Listen to Galatians 3.13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Galatians 3.13. Notice, however, in verse 4, that there is a limitation. It doesn't just say, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. It says to everyone that believe in. So God's righteousness is, is given to those who believe, even as it is available to anyone who will believe. So I guess I've, I've reached a point, uh, I'm not going to go any further here, uh, but he's going to go on and talk about Moses describes the law and, and verify it that way. But I look out here and, and knowing, I already talked about uh, there being a, what do we call it, a streaming, you know, the service. And so I know there's going to be people that, that are watching or maybe will watch. And, and I'm, I have to ask, all of you here and those that may be watching or may watch, what about you? can't come to God through an established way that, that man has come up with. It can only be through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Through faith that he died for your sins, he was buried and rose again. And it takes believing that. And we pass from death unto life. And at that moment, we don't always act out the righteousness of God. We can kind of still be a little rebellious at times, but we are given that position of the righteous, righteousness of God. If you are here and you haven't trusted Him, do so today. And if you are out there uh, in internet land and, and you have questions, send me a message. Do whatever you need to do because we would love more than nothing than for you to know I am righteous in God's sight. Uh, let's close in prayer. God and Father, thank you for this opportunity to be reminded of these things. Uh, and to just take time uh, quoting uh, and uh, looking into your scripture and reminded, being reminded ultimately that you are a God who took care of everything so that we could be brought back to you. The only response that we have today, or the only requirement, is that we believe it. So Father, you work on hearts, you work on minds, you convict where conviction is needed, embolden. Or maybe someone has some questions, but, but it's a little shy to ask. Give them the boldness to, to reach out to me, to someone else. But Father, also to, to confirm and reaffirm uh, what some of us already know. Through it all, Father, I pray that we have seen you get all the honor and the glory and the praise. Thank you in the name of our only Savior and our way, Jesus Christ.